every semester so far, I've had to start assigning questions and, and making them worth grade points in order for you in order to get a good discussion going. But I'm hoping that you I was hoping that because we're going back this semester to in person teaching would need to do that. Anywho, um, I, I want to stress again, reconstruction is so complicated and so difficult to understand and so difficult, I think, for us as 21st century Americans to understand because uh, for the most part, when wars are over, the losing side usually has to do uh, quite a lot to repair. Uh, or, or, or owes quite a lot to the conquering side, the winning side. This is certainly true in World War I, maybe, maybe even to a harsh degree in World War I, and, and definitely true in, in World War II. And in theory, uh, I want to argue that the, the former Confederates get off lightly, the, and, and, but I'm going to take it a bit a step further. I'm going to say the former Confederates get off lightly in both radical reconstruction and presidential reconstruction, and then of course in the failure of reconstruction. In other words, compared to other wars, um, or war, certainly wars of this kind, radical reconstruction, that is land confiscations, giving land to, uh, giving land to former slaves, uh, making sure former Confederates officers can never hold office. Uh, I think even taking away the vote from some Confederate officers, would depend that that was uh, these were all measures um, uh, put forth by, by radical Republicans, and uh, they would be considered mild by the standards of World War I or the standards of World War II, or even by the standards of the Spanish American War. I mean, the Spanish American War is fought, and, and the uh, uh, United States is able to get, you know, Cuba and the Philippines and all kinds of other stuff. So, so the, the United States, the Union, doesn't, isn't, to my mind, my historical mind anyway, being unreasonable in the early days of Reconstruction. Um, now, of course, Lincoln had famously said he wanted liberality all around. He wanted uh, a very gentle Reconstruction. We don't know how long how that would have lasted uh, if he had lived, because of course Lincoln tried to avoid the war in the first place, and Lincoln tried, uh, you know, Lincoln was always his political ideas and even ideologies. Certainly, his political action was always evolving as circumstances demanded. So, in my personal historian's view, I think it's very likely that Lincoln would have eventually cracked down on um, and, and gone more towards the radical Republicans in Congress than, than in the middle. But uh, we will never know. So what would Lincoln do, WWLD, is, is an interesting question for, for a, a, you know, after dinner conversation, but it's not, it's impossible to know. Anyway, that's a, a, enough about me. So when you watch Go, Gone with, the, enough about my ideas, when you watch Gone with the Wind and you see this, you know, absolutely horrible, depiction of horrible and ahistorical, a depiction of, of the post-Civil War South and its effects on plantation owners. Um, and, and people feel sorry for them because of the movie. You know, that's really a movie. That's just not literally not how it, how it happened. Uh, lots of Southerners, us landowners did um, suffer, but, you know, they're, you know, they brought war on the United States. So, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, I think they got off easy. Maybe there was no other way around it, you know, without the, without the splitting off again. But, but anyway, that's a long way of saying that reconstruction, this one of the reasons that reconstruction is complicated is because the American government is constantly shifting and trying to, uh, after, especially after radical reconstruction is taken over by presidential reconstruction, the American government is constantly shifting towards a softer, much more accommodating reconstruction, much more accommodating to the, to the former Confederates reconstruction than it had started off with. Um, let me, before we, before we launch in, into the questions uh, on the discussion, Jim, let me ask you, uh, oops, crap. People are trying to get in on a... Uh, 
Alexis and, uh, and, and whoever was just coming in, I'm sorry that I, I, was, I was looking at our discussion agenda and I didn't see that you were in the waiting room. So you're kind of hanging out there for a little while. I'll, I'll put that off to the side so that I always know, I'll put that notification off the side so I always know that someone is, is waiting. So before we launch into the questions though, let me ask you, what did you think about, what did you learn about reconstruction? What did you think about, think about reconstruction after listening to the lecture, after doing uh, the reading? How much does it jive with what you've learned before? How much does it not jive with what you learned before? That sort of thing. I just thought that it was really confusing because okay. it- Don't, By the way, join the club. It is very confusing. <laughs> it almost contradicted everything that I've learned before. Okay, and so so tell us some of the things you've learned before. Um, so obviously, like after the war, the slaves were no longer slaves, but I didn't know that they had a lot of rights for a while where they did hold office and were like congressmen and they, I believe they were able to vote too. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then... Men, men were. Men, yeah. And then after that ended, then all of that was taken away from them. And that's something that I didn't know, which really confused me. Uh, hang on one second. Micah Jones is having difficulty getting in. Just emailed me. Okay. Uh, yes, that's absolute. That's absolutely true. I mean, you can't, it's just shocking how many changes the, the South goes through, how many changes that, uh, that um, uh, Reconstruction sort of brings in. It's amazing that the country in many ways survived Reconstruction. And by the way, that's one, one of the reasons why I think, and what we think most historians think, that people are exhausted by 1876, 77. You know, just they want to wash their hands of it. I know, in, in, for instance, in Ireland, for the longest time in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, when there was there were troubles between troubles in Northern Ireland, I remember being in Ireland and a lot of my friends in the South and the Republic of Ireland saying, I wish we could just cut Northern Ireland off and, and, and drag it out to sea and forget about it. Well, there are a lot of Americans in it by 1875, six, seven, who are saying, I wish we could just cut, you know, Cut the South, cut the Confederacy off, drag it out to sea, and let them sink or swim on their own. Uh, what else did you did you think? I feel like Reconstruction is just so frustrating. Because mm -hmm. like frustrating. it's it seemed we would, we would take like two steps forward and then five back. Like come yeah. on, man. Well, I think that's true. And I think anybody, anybody um, would agree with that. The, 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 uh, uh, and people are kind of surprised that Johnson acted uh, the way, sorry, so I forgot to put up the chat here. Uh, Alyssa is agreeing. Uh, what was I just saying? I was kind of, um, well, we're surprised that Johnson, especially since Johnson himself was very anti, he was very pro small farmer, non slaveholding farmer in the South, very anti large plantation owner, right? He himself was the only senator from the Confederacy to stay loyal and, and, and kept his seat in, in, in Congress, in, in the Senate. Um, so Johnson caving in and caving in and caving in seemed just to be a, a, a surprise and, and very, very frustrating. Who else was, was uh, confused or, or perhaps even frustrated? I think it's fair to say that when you read about Reconstruction, you kind of want to ha get to an answer. You want to, well, why is this happening specifically? Blah, 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 blah. blah. And it's just the, the, the answers in the background are just so complicated. It's just, it's just frustrating. 
I wouldn't say that I was frustrated. I was more so annoyed because it was just going um, back and forth like African Americans had rights and then they didn't and then they did and then they didn't. And honestly, I thought it was like just um, a little unfair. Um, not really frustrating, a little nerve wracking more than anything. Yeah, well, nerve wracking and frust is, is, is frustrating. Annoying is, frust is frustrating, sorry. <coughs> Put them on mute while I have my little fit here. Um, but you can see you can see that that uh, intense times country often doesn't countries often don't operate well. You know, we are going through tense times now, and 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 the country really isn't operating. Uh, very well, and people changing their minds and changing their complete ideologies every other day, it seems, uh, in, in, in Washington. Uh, what else? So far, this has been really good. Uh, normally, I really have to drag uh, students to start talking on the first day. Uh, yeah, I think Alyssa is saying here, uh, it's frustrating because even though the African Americans are freed, and then they were not always a, 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 actually be free to the, the black codes and the constant changes the, the rug is constantly being pulled out uh, from under them. Right. By the way, th there are a lot of people in the North who complain about this. A lot of people in the South who complain about this. There are, after all, Southern, there were always Southern Unionists, don't forget, especially in the upcountry in North Carolina, especially in places like Tennessee, uh, especially in places like Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky wasn't part of the Confederacy, but it was a slave owning state. And, um, and they say, look, damn it, we, we fought this war to preserve the union and to end slavery. And now, uh, and, and all of our uh, sons and some of our daughters died in this war. And by 1876, there was a sort of like, and now we're sort of giving in to these old, uh, old Confederates, some of whom should be in jail. I'm, I'm saying what these people, in the North are, are saying, were saying at the time, uh, the changes are constant. What else? I think on paper, the um... With the 13th and 14th Amendment, Reconstruction looks good, but in reality, it, it just wasn't good at all for African Americans. And slavery was gone legally, but in reality, it was still there with the Black Codes. And the sharecropping, too. Sharecropping Correct. becomes uh, not a form of slavery, technically, but, but certainly not a very... Uh, pleasant way to live. And of course, a lot of poor whites suffer under slave cropping, sharecropping as well. All right, well, well, since you, who was that again that just said that, Nolan? Yeah. Okay, since you brought up 13th and 14th Amendments, let's talk about this. this is question number one, what important pieces of legislation were passed during Reconstruction and how did they change American life? Nolan's mentioned the 13th and 14th Amendment. By the way, let's make sure we know what those things are. What was the 13th Amendment? It abolished slavery, basically. Abolished slavery. Okay, what was the 14th Amendment? It guaranteed civil rights for all people. Citizenship rights, right? Uh, uh, these, are, these are extremely Im important um, uh, um, amendments and, and as some of you may know, passing the 13th Amendment wasn't easy. Passing the 14th Amendment was, was, was easier, uh, but it wasn't super easy. Um, what about the 15th Amendment? They couldn't deny the right to vote anymore based on race. Right. Right. Okay, sorry that you can hear my cough drop rattling around in my mouth. It must sound gross. Yeah, these, th these are things are very, very 
important. You, it, I can't, there, there's, well, apart from the very, very beginning, when, when the first 10 amendments of the Constitution were adopted, I can't think of any period in American history where, let me just check my dates here, but three constitutional amendments are passed within, uh, within uh, five years. Okay. Uh, 13, 14, 15. Uh, so, you know, it, it just, uh, it, if, if what Lincoln said in his second inaugural is the country is going to have, country must have a new birth of freedom, it certainly looks like because of 13, 14, and 15, that the country is going through that new, new, new birth of freedom. It is going through those birthing pains because constitutional amendments are not easy to, to, you know, you just can't do it over 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 a cup of coffee it takes a tremendously uh laborious process um what about other types of legend by the way there's construction going on in the house next door to mine so you may hear banging and um stuff uh that's not me jackhammering uh in my basement that's people next door jackhammering their basement uh what was I asking you? Okay, so anyway, so there there are these. Uh, uh, let me ask the second part of that question. At least for when it comes to the constitutional amendments, how did they change American life? Well, I would suspect that day to day they don't change very much, uh, just in the way that. You know, people treat one another no. daily life experience would not be terribly different than it was before well that's probably true yeah uh, except that an awful lot of um white redemptionists would 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 um were extremely angry and felt that they felt that they were then being discriminated against uh you know that they they look to uh, their their state legislature and they see it full or partly full of um, of uh, African American uh, former slaves and they're they're just well a lot of them the racist ones certainly are are disgusted by it but have who has who has seen Birth of a Nation the, the film Birth of a Nation I should put that up on your your um, your thing, your uh, what do you call it? Your uh, your module. Has anyone seen this film? Seen it's parts very, of it. Yeah, it's a very, very uh, uh, shocking. It's a very, very. Um, hang on a second. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to do this in real time. I'm going to add this to your module. This is like rocket science for me. This is like this is like going to the moon. Um, Birth of a Nation film. I'm putting the uh, the link to it on on your module. It's free on YouTube because it's so old. It's hundred and lucky. It's hundred and ten years old ish. Almost 10 years old. Uh, almost 100 years. Yeah, almost 110 years old. Um, anyway, there's a very famous scene in that that film where they show the 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 they have a depiction of the interior of uh, of the of the South Carolina legislature meeting, and it's it's all African American Congress uh, state representatives. And they have the the film has them all jumping around like and I and I mean this literally like monkeys in a zoo. It's purposely uh, staged that way to give you the impression that um, th that the, the state legislatures are now being taken over by people who are half animal and half human. It's just uh, and it's all by the way white actors in blackface. Uh, it's not African American actors, so it's it's really very. Um, that impression was very, very strong among certain groups of people. Um, 
Yeah, Alyssa's right. It changed it, gave Black people the right to whether they were granted citizenship. There were a number of other pieces of legislation. There were the Ku Klux Klan Acts, uh, 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 things like that, that uh, um, tried to cut out, tried to, tried to crack down on civil rights violations and violence in, in the South. Let's move on to the, to the next question. How did African-Americans respond to emancipation? Seems like they begun to, or tried to begin to organize in different towns and groups that eventually try to gain what they believed was done to them, such as land and bringing their families back together after being sold. Yeah, that's an extremely important, was that Nolan said that? No, that was an extremely yeah. important aspect of emancipation, uh, of reconstruction life for African-Americans was trying to find your family members who'd been sold uh, in years previous. Um, that was almost, I don't wanna say it was the first thing that people did once the 13th Amendment was ratified, but it was damn near the, third, the first thing that that people did. Okay. Okay, Ashlyn's saying they set up schools and churches for themselves. Now, why is this important, Ashlyn? Why was this important? Or anybody? Let me mute myself and sneeze. That way they could better educate themselves. And for the first time, they were able to read the Bible themselves? Um, maybe not for the first time for all of them, but for an awful lot of them, yes. Uh, Karina, you were going to say something, practice their own faith, yeah? Yeah, I was going to say something, but um, someone had already said it with mentioning how they were um, educating themselves for religion. Also, let's not forget that one of the big changes here is that African-American schools and African-American churches had existed, slave schools and slave churches and slave religious gatherings had existed before the Civil War, but they were kind of underground, right? Uh, slave owners were wanted slaves to read, the, to, 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 to have Christian religion and to, um, and slave owners made sure to use it in, in a certain way, which was to help reinforce the notions that slave owners believed that this was the this was the way way of God. This is the will of God. You know, this is your order in society. This is all natural. This is all biblical, uh, and and definitely tried to push slaves away from the liberation themes in the Bible, Moses, and all of, all of that stuff. Uh, well, that was being taught in these kind of secret schools and, and religious services. Well, where as um, after, after, the, after the wars over, after emancipation, those things can come to the surface, right? You can, in theory, set up your own school, set up your own church, set up your, you know, and there's, there's no law against it, right? How else did African Americans respond to emancipation? What did they want? What, as as a whole, this is a generalization, but as a whole, what did African Americans want more than anything else? Limited freedom. Uh, freedom, yes, but okay, they have. They have, let's just for this for the sake of argument say okay, they've got they've got freedom. Ashland's saying land. Hmm. Tyler, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say control of their families. Um, emotionally, this is an interesting, this is an interesting point, and you're both right. Tyler's right, Ashlyn's right. The, uh, the, the first impulse, of course, is to try to find, to re, re, reunite families, try to find families, a family has been sold off or had run away or whatever. Uh, and, and you get these advertisements in newspapers all over the North, all over the South, looking for so-and-so who used to use my sister and blah, 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 blah. 
Uh, so that's like the first thing that pre that pre occupies their mind, in fact, preoccupies their, their lives. But then pretty quickly, uh, you know, you know the, those, those things continue to happen, but pretty quickly, African-Americans realize they need land. Uh, everything in the South is land. It's not like the North where you can work for wages. Uh, you can gain, you can gain a certain amount of economic independence in theory as a, as a wage worker. You need land in the South. And that's exactly what they concentrate on. And that's exactly what becomes the bone of contention. In what ways did the government, or more importantly, and I like to emphasize this every time we talk about this in class, more importantly, the army, the US army, attempt to do about this land question. Everyone's heard the phrase 40 acres and a mule. Well, what, what is that all about? Was this where um, they would give land to Blacks and they would say you can have this land, but make them almost like work for free on it? Was it, is that what we're talking about? No, that's, that's sharecropping. Um, which is what happens afterwards, yes. But what, what was the sort of 40 acres and a mule, at least idea, if not practice, Lexi? I honestly don't remember because that's what I thought it was whenever I just said that, but. Oh, okay, well, look, anybody else? Well, we're gonna discuss more about this when on Tuesday, when we discuss what's known as field order, fifth special field order or something like that, 15 by Sherman's army in Georgia. Um, but essentially what happens is the army, because the South has kind of got divided up into military districts, this is still under radical reconstructions before Johnson really is able to start messing things up. Um, the army takes some remarkably forward looking, forward thinking and forward uh, 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 and progressive steps, if you will, towards uh, redistribution of land to the people who had actually worked it. So uh, African-Americans were promised, African-Americans in certain areas were promised a piece of land and a mule if they would work it for a certain number of years uh, they could work it and keep the, the profits, but it still belonged to the government. But technically after, I can't remember what the number of years is not very long, uh, that it would, then it would become theirs. They would become the legal owners of it. Okay. Now that doesn't get implemented everywhere. It doesn't get implemented very well. And African-American generations ever since have sort of looked at that and, and, and well, there's the government you know, ripping us off again, promising us something and then not falling through. So that's a serious problem. Uh, um, what, what was I gonna say about that? Okay, so, so the whole question of land continues. 40 acres and a mule is not as an idea or land grants as an idea across the South aren't successful. Uh, unfortunately, because the military didn't, enforce them well uh, strongly enough and, and they're getting crap from Andrew Johnson. Um, but it works in some places. There are a number of places in Mississippi and Louisiana where these where, where land changes are, are dramatic, but it's not enough. And so eventually what you, you end up with after Johnson, after presidential reconstruction is the former slave owners still getting back their land and then parceling it out to uh, former slaves and poor whites to be sharecroppers. So it's land in a way, but then they set up the sharecropping system. So it's, it's uh, uh, again, this for African-Americans and, the, and the, the feeling is passed down through generations for African-Americans. This has felt like, again, we get, we're getting the short end of the stick. Now, why? 
would um, or why did African Americans and lots of white sharecroppers feel that they've gotten the short end of the stick? What happens in sharecropping that makes it a problem? Because they would have just gotten liberated from doing free labor just so that they can go do free labor in a different way. Um, yeah, expand on that a little more, River. I don't quite get what you're getting at. Um, it's, it was sort of like a pseudo-legalized slavery where they would make a lot less money than they would deserve. Uh, yeah. yeah. It becomes that, certainly. What else? I also feel like what, with this, there's always the risk of them losing their land if they don't reap enough profit. So you're just constantly living penny to penny because you have to turn in what you make, but then you can't, if you don't turn in what you make or don't make enough, you lose the land. Right. Sharecropping in theory, you know, I'm glad I'm recording this because I'm saying in theory, is a good way to get landless people, give, give landless people land to work themselves, okay? Landless people who don't have any money, right? You're not like you can say, oh, it's to the slaves. Okay, great, you're free now, you need land. Well, of course, land's $100 an acre. Give, just give me $100, you're gonna have an acre, no problem. Well, slaves don't have any money, but well, no, certainly not $100 lying around, but anyway. So, so the idea that, that, that you, could give, you could get a piece of land and work it and give a percentage of your uh, um, take at harvest time to the land owner and keep the rest yourself, that in, on, in principle and theoretically could have worked very well. But again, the power relationships proved to be discriminatory and oppressive. How do land owners make sharecropping essentially what, uh, I forgot who just said it, Nolan or Tyler or somebody, somebody like slavery with just a different name. I think sharecropping, it said that it locked families into the land. It was like a constant cycle of debt and work to maintain that land. Uh, yeah, it's a constant cycle of debt for all kinds of reasons. They don't get a good deal in the first place, right? The percentage that they're asked to contribute back to the land owner is too high, okay? And bad, bad, during bad harvest times, they have to say sorry to the landowner. The landowner says, that's okay. I'll just, we'll just up the, the number next year, up the amount next year. Okay, but now I'm broke and I don't have any, I don't, I can't buy seed corn. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll lend you the seed corn. So eventually you just become, in, you just become working for your landowner because you owe them so much money, not because there was this arrangement where you, um, where you were given a certain amount of land and you could sort of barter uh, it off, you know, you pay in, in crop, to, to your rent for the land and then keep the rest that doesn't happen and then what's even worse was what happens to that this happens later on but we're going to we're going to call it the company store what happens with how african americans and and sharecroppers in general are able to get supplies or able to buy other food or other things how, where do they get that stuff and they just get like tokens that they could use at their master's store pretty much and go use them there so they didn't get actual money yeah and so so if you have to then if you're not even able to keep the let's say let's say the deal is 50 50 you give 50 percent of your harvest to the landowner and you're able to keep 50 percent of it yourself okay that's fine and let's just say one year it works but the 50 percent you're, you yourself, you're, you're given, they're not given real money, you're given tokens that you turn around and sell in the landlord's store, buy in the landlord's store at a tremendously inflated prices. You, you're just continually getting ripped off. You're tied 
to the land and tied to the debt. And, uh, and by the way, this happens all, all throughout the rest of the 19th century, even in the early 20th century. Company towns, uh, we should know this very well in our area because um, companies uh, would come in and, and they'd buy up a mill town or they'd create a, more or less create a mill and create a town around it and create the stores. And you, have, and you, were, you weren't paid in wages, you were paid in company script and the company script had to be sent, had to be spent at the company store. And you just, you're always behind, always behind. So that's perhaps one of the real, tra that, that is perhaps, that is among the, uh, in addition to the racist aspects of reconstruction, the real tragedy is just things keep going backwards, right? All right, what role did terrorism play in Reconstruction? Question number three. Yeah, Riley Kelly has written, is that Kelly Riley or Riley Kelly? And well, whatever your, okay, so your first name is Riley, okay. White supremacists didn't believe African Americans should have any such rights resulting in private and public hate groups using violence as a way to intimidate. All right. Okay. Now, Ashlyn, uh, Rashlyn's written violence was used to stop African Americans from voting. How is this possible when the 13th and 14th and indeed 15th Amendments have been passed? You know, people have been given civil rights. The, the way you could, could vote the federal government you know, can't have anything stronger than a constitutional amendment for the love of God. What, how does that get tinkered with by um, new Southern governments? Everything sounds great. 13th, 14th Amendment, 14th, 15th Amendment sounds great to uh, uh, to give the people a vote. And then the, the 15th Amendment prohibits states to uh, prohibits states from uh, refusing the right to vote in uh, based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude, the famous thing, famous line. What's the key element here? And by the way, this is going on in in our own time as well. I don't mean necessarily the racial, racial thing, although some people argue that too. There's a key element here about American democracy and the way American government works. That's extremely important. I feel there's like, oh, go ahead, Nolan. I was gonna say there's no enforcement. Uh, yeah, there's no enforcement, but let's let's look at uh, Scott, Skyler. Go ahead. I was that's what I was going to say. The government just isn't enforcing what they should be enforcing. They're kind of just letting the South do as they please. OK, except that the 15th Amendment says a federal and state government cannot deny citizens the right to vote based on a citizen's race, color or previous condition of servitude. Now. Since the dawn of the country, since the Constitution and all that stuff in the 18th century, states have run elections, right? So if the federal government says you're not allowed to discriminate on race, color, or previous condition of servitude, how do Southern white Southerners respond to that eventually in the 1870s and onwards? Okay, so uh, Alyssa. You're, you're, you're right here. They were given literacy tests, uh, which I think make it unfair, even though they're granted the right to vote. Yeah, you can't discriminate on race, color, or previous condition of service, but you can, you can say that in order to vote, you have to be literate. The state of Tennessee could make it pass that law. The state of Georgia could pass that law. The state of uh, Mississippi, state, the state of Pennsylvania could pass that law um, at this time. So you can, you, can, you can put all kinds of restrictions on voting rights to get around the 15th Amendment. And this is this lasts for a hundred years. 
literacy tests, grandfather clauses. You can only vote if your grandfather was able uh, to vote. Civics tests, you know, they'd get up and say, okay, we well, have to name all the members of Congress before you're allowed to vote. Well, and they, these were just uh, uh, ways to, with one hand, legally discriminate against adults trying, adult men trying, trying to vote. And then of course, with the other hand, there's the violence of the KKK and other people frightening people, frightening voters away from the polls. Okay, you go up to the poll and you, you're given a literacy test and you complain and blah, 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 blah. And they, they don't let you vote. And, the, and that night the Ku Klux Klan visits your house. What effect is that gonna have on you as a person, effect on your family, effect on your children as they're growing up, when, when it comes time to think about voting? You're gonna to be too scared to vote. Sure. And, and that's the rational reaction. Karina's saying traumatized, yeah. Even if you just speak up, even if you just say something, the next morning, there's a cross burning on your front yard, in your front yard. Now, now this didn't happen all the time, but it happened a lot. It's the, ra the rational reaction as well. I'm not gonna risk my life and more importantly, my family's lives uh, if I'm gonna vote. Peer pressure to the most extreme level. And in fact, uh, uh, Cecilia, you're onto something here because you had peer pressure in two ways for the, in regards to the terrorism. One, a lot of African-Americans, uh, these are sort of generalizations across the, uh, across the South, but it, they're, they're not bad as generalizations. Uh, you had African-American communities saying to, to, the, to their members of the community, look, we can't, we can't go out and risk votes. But if, if John Smith, a former slave goes and, and and tries to vote and make and puts up a, a fuss because of the literacy test and causes or trouble or, or or tries to force away a vote. They're not just going to come back and and burn a cross on John Smith's yard. They might attack John Smith's whole neighborhood. Right? The KKK. You know these are vicious, vicious, racist terrorists. They don't. They're not going to sit down and reason and reason things out like. Well, John didn't want to follow the literacy vote, and that's a, that's against the law. So we better tell him that it, you know they just go in and burn the whole neighborhood down. And this happens well, well into the 20th century. This happened in the famous Tulsa race riots in 1919. So, so there's peer pressure among African Americans. Like, okay, well, that that was fun while it lasted, but I'm not. I, we don't want. Don't I want my neighbor or my two doors over to get my house burned down because they want to vote. Then there's also peer pressure on, I, I really like this, uh, this idea, Cecilia, you get, you get brownie points for this one. Um, there's peer pressure in, the, in a lot of the white community because a lot of people uh, join the Ku Klux Klan because of friendships or whatever. And a lot of people are pressured into it. You know, if you're not with us, you're against us. And that can cause a lot of white people to do things they previously wouldn't have done before. And this is not excusing it in any way. It's still immoral. Uh, but, you know, these people can also get swept up in these things. All your family, uh, the men in your family seem to be vicious racist. So you become a vicious racist. All your friends are vicious racist. So you become a vicious racist. You know, it just, it's just, the peer thing is, is something that's extremely, extremely important. All right, I think, I think Alyssa, I, I think um, it causes discomfort in both groups, okay? Frankly, the only people who, well, this is, uh, this is almost too strong to say what I was gonna make. The best thing for an African-American to do, given what happened, uh, uh, and again, given the power structure was completely given back to the Confederates, more or less, after Reconstruction, was to leave the South. I mean, things aren't great for African Americans in the North or in the Midwest or 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 out West. 
a hell of a lot better than they were in Mississippi. I just started their buzzsaw going next door. Uh, but of course, that's not that's not very easy to do. It's expensive. It's uh, especially if you have a big family. In some ways, you could say that that the whole Reconstruction period, the whole Reconstruction attempts, and the way it was screwed up, and the way it was these rights were taken away from African Americans, and the hatred it brewed up, and and all this kind of stuff is. Uh, it's it, like they all fed off each other and it, 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 all those different elements made, made the whole thing worse, right? I'm not saying it's worse than slavery because obviously slavery is uh, the worst thing, but, but it's pretty, pretty awful. A lot of people consider the, the period between the end of Reconstruction and the 1940s as what's called the nadir, the bottom, you know, there's the apex and the nadir uh, of African-American life because things are just, you know, continue to be very, very bad. All right, how, why did Reconstruction end? There are all kinds of answers to this, but let's just hit the high points. Reconstruction kind of just like progressively died out due to the lack of the government enforcing like rules. I actually have a sticky note. Um, Uh, in my opinion, the Compromise of 1876 effectively ended Reconstruction after yeah. failing to protect the civil rights of Black Americans. Yeah. So what's the Compromise of 1876, 1877? It's one of the shabbiest things about American history. What, what happened? It was basically a deal, a deal cut to in order to make the election of 1876 go through. And 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 Alyssa's written written here. Um, you know, in order to certify the election, in order for Hayes to become president, all that sort of stuff, the U.S. government pulled out the last troops from the South, and that ended the Reconstruction area era. Okay, uh, and again, you can't, you can't be, I mean, people complain all the time about politics now. It seems very dirty, extremely polarized, all this stuff. Uh, I'm not saying that there's a sort of scoreboard or, or a ranking of things, but you can't get any worse than, we can, than the compromise of 1876, 77, because it's, it's just as, it's just as, as uh, grubby as he can get, politically speaking, you know, nobody with any backbone stood up and said, "No, no, no this is gonna. We're not gonna." Lincoln didn't die for this crap. Nobody's well. People do say that, but not, nobody in Congress or the presidency. Uh, well, it, uh, uh, Grant is out by this time, but no one, no one in Congress does anything about that. Very shameful. Yeah, Sophie and Sophie's here exactly right. In a sense, I still think they had to reconstruct the nation past 1876. So that leads us, Sophie, Sophia, why don't you jump in and, and start us off on question five there? Was reconstruction a success or failure? Um, I think it was a failure just because it kept going back and forth and they couldn't decide on one thing like there's so many different opinions on both sides that nobody wanted to um, compromise on anything right what else who else can tell us whether it's a success or a failure well, just looking at the economic state the south was almost in Great Depression, and which led to somewhat of a depression because they couldn't recover from the war. Yeah, and of course there is the economic panic of 1873. There are all kinds of other stuff that, all kinds of other things that are going on that make conditions in general worse than, than they might have been. 
what well, well, let's uh, since we're down on reconstruction and i think we should be because it's a terrible thing you know but there are some successes what were some of the successes the slaves were freed yeah if you take the war and the early part of reconstruction slavery's ended that's a huge thing if you take the 13th amendment as a Reconstruction Amendment, not technically it's a war amendment because it happened, the war wasn't over when it was passed, but, but sort of that 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are still very positive just because the uh, Southerners figure, figure out nasty ways around the 15th Amendment uh, doesn't mean the 15th Amendment isn't at least in principle a good thing. What else do you, do you see as a success or a failure? It allowed them to organize, such as the schools and churches, and establish their own basic provisions. Uh, yeah, the schools and churches thing is very, very important because that continues. Okay, and those become the two largest institutions for African Americans in the South that are successful by far. Partly that that set up like the the uh, historically black universities uh, are set up by the federal government or with help from the federal government, but those things become uh, uh, very successful, right? Now it's it's obviously wrong that that the only way an African American in the South could get a higher education was to go through one of these places, but um, at least there was a possibility. So in, in many ways, this is why African-Americans for so long are so, are so constantly frustrated and, and angry because not only do you have the rug pulled out from under them in, um, in reconstruction, but because of this uh, end runs that these Southern legislatures take around the 15th amendment, you have the whole period of Jim Crow. Well, hell, that lasts, as I said, until technically Jim Crow lasts until 1965. Uh, and that in 1965, that's within my lifetime, barely within my life. It's in my lifetime. It's within your parents' lifetime, possibly within your grandparents' lifetime. Uh, well, certainly within your grandparents' lifetime. Um, uh, what was I going to say? So uh, if the fact that it, 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 Reconstruction is such a mess and so and everyone sort of gives up, I think helps explain why Jim Crow is, is so successful. I think that's a very, very important thing. Okay, let me ask one final question before we go here. What did you learn so far? Oh, wait. Um, Kylie saying, I do think that it got the ball rolling for discrimination legislation and certain civil rights acts to be made, though they did not work in the way that they fully work in the way that they should have been. Yeah, absolutely right. Okay. And by the way, the 15th Amendment, for instance, this sort of defines citizenship and, and 14th Amendment define, uh, sorry, the 14th Amendment defines citizenship, which, you know, which can, can also then be used by other groups later on, the end of the 19th, early 20th century, the Chinese immigrants, for instance, use the, the 14th Amendment to successfully appeal for birthright citizenship in the United States. Um, so this, you know, there are a lot of, there are a handful of standout things, but it's just shocking how badly it was handled. So, so let, me, let, me, what, what, let me get back to that question. What did you learn about reconstruction that you didn't already know did this open your eyes in, in any way we'll talk more about the documents on tuesday but i'm just interested to uh hear what you think what do they teach you about reconstruction in high school i mean my high school history classes were present in high school were pretty good so i feel like i had a pretty well-rounded idea of reconstruction mm -hmm. well that's good
I was going to say I didn't fully understand the concept of reconstruction previously, and it's been mm -hmm. a while since I've had a history class. But um, in high school, we didn't do in-depth conversations like we've done today, which I've I've really missed out on. So I really like today's class and how we had like a really in-depth conversation about it because I'd never had that before, and that really helped me to understand more about it. Okay, good. Well. The, bring that understanding then to the documents for Tuesday's discussion. Uh, I, I haven't put up a discussion agenda yet about the documents in the reader for Tuesday yet because I wanted to see how much you folks participated. Um, that can sometimes be a problem. Not enough people are participating. And this has been pretty, pretty damn good. Uh, not everyone... Uh, 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 jumped in, but a, an awful lot of people did. And I'm very happy about that. So what I'm going to do, so I was waiting to see whether I had to, they had to uh, uh, wait and see whether I had to assign questions to certain groups of people. You remember how we did that last year, Skylar? Yes. Yeah, well, uh, so far, if you keep it up, you all of you, I won't have to do that. So now I'm going to go off and, and, and do the questions for Tuesday. And they're going to be open-ended like this. They're not going to be assigned specific ones to do uh, by person, but by individuals. So do them all. Uh, and again, I hope we can have a good conversation like this next time without me having to force people to answer certain questions. Okay. This is my way of saying good job. All right. Anything else? Anything else we have to talk about? in terms of what's covered and reconstructed in the main text. Alyssa says, nope, so it must be nope. Okay, uh, where, oh, sorry, where are the, oh, crap. Sorry, my screensaver went turned on and now I'm having to re-log in. Karina, you said, where are the questions? I couldn't find it. Uh, they're in, um, let me, let me uh, do the share screen business in the modules, but, but you may not know how those work if you haven't, let's see, I'll do share screen here, desktop one, yada yada. Okay, in, in Canvas, when you're in your course, your course, go to course modules. Well, here's your course, right? Go to modules. And here's reconstruction. Like as we were talking about birth of a nation, I put it up. Well, we're just talking. Well, here's the discussion agenda question for today. Now, in here, after the one o'clock class, will be the discussion agendas for for Thursday and for um, for two next Tuesday and Thursday. Okay. In addition to some other stuff, I'm going to put a podcast or two up there for our Thursday discussion. So remember, Tuesday's discussion is the document reader, chapter 15, American Yop document reader, chapter 15, not main text. And then Thursday, we'll talk about these sort of other things that, that I'm going to put in. So look for this stuff after lunch. Uh, well, actually, I teach from 1 to 2.30 and teach from 2.30 to 4, so it'll be after 4 all this stuff will be put in. But this is not, so far, I'm very happy. This is not what happened last year. Almost nobody talked. I had a few people, Emily, uh, uh, Skyler, a, a handful of other people that talked, uh, that, that contributed very well, but the, you folks are doing a lot better, so keep it up. Uh, and those of you who are were quiet today, jump in on Tuesday, all right? Did we ever figure out if we would be on in class or online Tuesday? Yeah, I uh, I talked about that a little bit at the beginning. Uh, and in fact, I've been check. I've been sort of glancing at my email as we've been talking because I've just wait for I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know, for them to say, "Oh, well, we're gonna we're gonna take this coming week off too," because Oakland is not going back. 
it's Oakland is staying remote for two more weeks, I think. But uh, we're not getting any email like that from the administration in Greensburg. So um, until you hear differently, yes, we will be back in class on Tuesday. Okay. Now, let me say this since I've got you here in a, a rapt attention. Uh, I went down to campus the other day um, and uh, saw the rooms. I've never actually been to the campus before because every time I've talked for you, it's been remote. So this is a new thing for me. The rooms are very big. And this is a good thing for, for now. So let's make sure we're all socially distanced and all that uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday. I think your class meets in a, in a normal classroom but it's a very big one. So uh, it, it'll look a bit odd for us to be spread out, but I think that university is gonna want us to do that. All right. Yes, no, maybe. Hands up, well, the thumbs up, yep. or whatever they call. Okay. All right, so again, look for your stuff around five or six o'clock tonight and uh, I will we'll talk to you. I will hopefully see you on on Tuesday. That'll be really something. Okay. Adios. Have a good day. Have a good day. Thank you.